right now. Your body can be healed. You can speak in tongues and be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. For in an atmosphere like this, there is nothing that is impossible with God. I just want to be with you. Oh, I just want to be with you. I'm trying to belabor this today, but if it's permissible, would you grab the hand of your neighbor? You don't know anything about what's going on in their lives. You don't know anything about their situations today, but I feel the Holy Ghost is drawing us right now. Would you find somebody and just begin to pray a prayer of faith over them right now? The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And that when you can pray the prayer of faith, not only is that need going to be supplied, but that their, their soul can be saved. Somebody can be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost before the word ever goes forth today. Would you begin to pray over them right now? In Jesus' name. Come on, lift your voice. We're a praying church. Lift your voice right now. I'm believing for strength to come spiritually into individuals right now. I speak healing in this building. If there is pain in their body, I speak, Lord healing in this house right now Jesus I speak faith because even when the world makes it look like it's impossible even when things look disguised as, as it's an impossibility Lord my faith can rise in this atmosphere and miracles will take place Lord you said you gave to every person a measure of faith that measure is enough today you're not just enough you're more than enough in my situation but you've given me enough faith to believe that you're working for my good. Even when I don't see it, I know you're working. Even when I can't feel it in my situation, I know that you've not forsaken me. Never have we seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Oh, come on, somebody. I feel the Holy Ghost working in our midst right now. In Jesus' name. Come on, if you don't have the words to say, that's all right. He's bottling up those tears in this room. He's storing them in in heaven today if all you can do is speak in tongues that's all right the holy ghost makes intercession for you god's working in our midst in jesus name come on come on somebody come on somebody it's happening it's happening right now with us again right now, King of Glory.
again. Sing it again. Sing it from your heart. Say, King of glory. King of Would you make glory. that your prayer? One more time. King of glory. King of glory. Fill this place. I just want to be with you. I just want to be with you. Now would you thank him for his presence in this house today? Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you, Lord, for your glory that's filling this place today, God. You answer prayer. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go to Exodus chapter 33. Moses says to the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet you said, I know thee by name. This is Moses talking to the Lord. Lord, you told me you know me by name and that I have also found grace in your sight. Now, therefore, I pray thee, Moses said, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee. You said you know me. I want to know you. That I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And the Lord responds, My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. Wow. Moses said, If your presence go not with me, carry us up, not a pence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that in that thou goest with us, Just because you go with us, doesn't that mean we've got grace? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing also that you've spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Notice he says that over and over and over. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Notice the interesting response of the Lord here in verse 19. He said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. We feel the presence of the Lord in this house today. And he is speaking to us in this house. And I want to just preach very quickly today on this subject. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. Would you pray with me right now one more time? God, I want your spirit to have its way. God, I feel a stirring in the Holy Ghost today. You're working in hearts and lives. You're encouraging us all across this building. God, I want this word today to be an infusion of strength to those that have barely been able to walk in here today. Not physically, but spiritually. And God, we walk into this building with more questions than we have answers. But God, help us to get our focus off of our problems and our circumstance today to look at your word. And it's going to direct us to your glory. And God, I believe you're going to confirm your word in this house today. In Jesus' name. Would everybody say in Jesus' name? Would you thank him in advance for what he's getting ready to do in this house today? Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you. I praise you, God. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated today. We miss Sister Ross, also the McCoys traveling today. And uh, this time of year, that happens quite regularly. But We miss them today. Just wanted to mention that. Those are the ones we've heard about. Also, Sister Linda Alley's very sick today. We keep her in your prayers. Uh, trying to encourage her to <clears throat> maybe even get a second opinion from a regular, uh, another doctor. She's been to her regular doctor. Um, just very, very sick lady. Continue to pray for her. It was a very difficult time for Moses. It's hard to imagine now the emotional state that he was in when he had this remarkable conversation with God. 
It's difficult to describe what it must have felt like to go from where he had been to where he was now in just such a short amount of time. Moses had just come down from the mountain having spent 40 days in the presence of the Almighty God. It was an incredible experience. It was far beyond what you or I could probably comprehend today. In this one month and ten day period, Moses had communed with God in such a way that God's presence literally engulfed his very being. It was on this mountaintop that Moses received directly from the hands of God. Tables of stone that had been hewn out, the Bible says, with God's own hand. What that means is God's finger had written on this rock the Ten Commandments. It was here that Moses saw the tabernacle in all of its detail. He not only was told about it, but God evidently constructed it in a vision that Moses received. And after God laid out all the details of both the construction of the tabernacle and the observance of the law, he summed it up by saying this, Moses, build it like I showed you on the mountain. It was at this time that Moses entered into an entirely new relationship unlike any other before. It was between mankind and the Almighty. A new dispensation would begin In the 40 days when Moses communes with God upon the mountain. How can we describe what it must have been like? The power of God was very powerful and present. Moses would hear the word and the voice of God with his literal ear. And God communed with this man for 40 days in a way that can only be imagined. And then he came down from the mountain only to find that the children of Israel were dancing around a golden calf naked that they had fashioned with their own hands. It was at that moment where the hands of men were contradicting the very hand of God. Moses on the way down, he's joined by Joshua. If you remember the story, the story would tell you that Joshua was was asked to stop and, and wait halfway up the mountain for Moses to return. And so great was the sound of the idol worship that when they are coming down the mountain and they hear the sound, Joshua misunderstands what he's hearing and tells Moses it sounds like a call to war. Needless to say, Moses, when he sees what's taking place, is very angry and terribly disappointed with the people of God. So overwhelmed with emotion that on seeing their idolatry, he took the tables of stone that God had given him and would smash them against a rock. Charging into the camp, he would destroy the golden calf, melt it in a fire, grind the cool metal into a powder, sprinkle it on the pool of water, and then command every one of them to drink it. Who is on the Lord's side, Moses said. Let him come unto me. Those who joined Moses were commanded to slaughter those who did not. And so brother against brother, tribe against tribe, you will find that 3,000 men would perish. And after this bloody tragedy, Moses would send the people to their tents and retreated to seek the face of God. And here he prayed one of the Bible's most incredible prayers that you will ever find. He said, God, if you're not going to forgive them, if you are going to block them out of your book, then take my name out as well. No, the Lord said, Moses, you don't understand. I'm tired of their murmuring and their grumbling and their complaining and their lack of faith. I'm tired of it, Moses. I'll I'll just take you and let's go over here and let's start a new nation. And Moses said, no, you can't do that, God. Your word is involved in this. And your word is more important than me or anything else in this earth. And so if you can't forgive them, God, then just put me and lump me in the sum with their sin and blot me out as well. This intercessory prayer that is found in your Bible moves God. And this very prayer stayed the hand of judgment and would spare Israel as a nation. And after this prayer, Moses gave the order to construct and to pitch the tabernacle for which God had given him the plan. And for the very first time, the tabernacle would stand in the middle of the camp. It was no doubt a dramatic moment. 
for everybody who would witness it. They surely remembered it for the rest of their lives. It was his tent that would serve as the center of their relationship with God for centuries to come. Every time they would tear down and set camp back up, the first thing to be erected in the middle of where they were going to set camp would be this tent called the tabernacle. The first service had no choir singing. There was no joy. There was no trumpets. There was only a lonely, solitary, broken-hearted man who walked alone through this entire camp. Every head of the household would stand at the door of his tent and would silently watch as this man would walk by. And he came to the entrance of this tabernacle, pushed aside the badger skin, and would step inside. And there Moses worshipped God all by himself. You know the story, the pillar of fire and the cloud would descend and hover over the door of the tabernacle and God entered his sanctuary. It was in this holy place that Moses had the conversation with God that we read in our text this morning. He was crushed. He was deeply wounded for he had great visions for what God would do with his people and those dreams had been shattered. Moses came to that place of worship a needy man. He came so desperate for something from God Moses would kneel and pray God refresh my vision and renew my purpose and Moses would hunger to experience the call of God over his life again now therefore he said I pray you if what you told me is true if I have found grace in your sight if you really know me by name God if you've called me to preach and you've called me to lead these people If you've put me in this city and if you've placed me in this church, if you've placed your hand upon me, if all of this is true, God, then show me your way because I cannot do it on my own. I cannot make it by myself. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I can't see the path anymore. Show me your way. I'm here to preach to us in this building today. You can walk into this house a needy man a needy woman but thanks be to God his presence is here and you can pray the exact same prayer and say God I'm sick of how my life I'm tired of fighting this same battle over and over and over but God show me your way I'm here to tell somebody today your way don't work but God's way does And when we get into the presence of God, we ought to pray it every time. God, show me your way. And So Moses, the man of God, he prays that I may know thee, that I may find grace in your sight. Now remember who's praying here. That I may know you. This is Moses. This is the man. Anybody remember the title that was given to him? David's known as the man after God's own heart. Anybody remember what they said about Moses? He was the friend of God. This is the one who heard the voice of God in the burning bush. Anybody ever had a tree talk to you? No. I know some people think their animals talk to them, but I don't believe it. Anyway, this is the one who heard literally a voice coming from the bush. This is the man who, who... who spoke the words and God honored those words because they gave, he gave it to him and plagues came across all of Egypt. Water turned into blood. Frogs crawled out of the river everywhere. Lice infested their clothing. Oh, heaven help us. Boils came on their bodies. Hail, hail fell from heaven. Locusts devoured their crops. Darkness fell on their land and death came to every home that blood was not applied. This is the same man who held a shepherd's staff over the Red Sea and it opened up so Israel could march through on dry ground. (coughs) When he held that staff over the sea again, it closed up and God's enemies were destroyed. He brought water from a rock with his words and victory over the enemy with his uplifted hands. He was the man whose face shined with the glory of God. So much so that one time it had to be hidden by a veil because nobody could look at him. It was so bright. This was the man who made the bitter waters of Mara sweet. This was the man who prayed and the Lord delivered his meal by quails coming and filling the camp of Israel. He was the one for whom angel 
food fell in the wilderness called manna. This same man reached a point where in his life he said, God, I don't even know if I really know you. I don't even know if I'm your child. Please show me your way. Let me know you again. His life was so hard and the circumstances of the moment were so crushing. Moses said, I need to renew myself in you. It was not an accident that the first prayer in the tabernacle was a prayer of personal revival and renewal. Let me tell you that we today are not exempt from such kinds of discouragement. For if Moses could feel this way, our feelings sometimes can become like that. If Moses could come from the mountaintop one moment to a deep valley within the next, then none of us can make it through this life without sometime feeling the need to be sure God I just want to make sure I'm in your hand there are times in our walk with God that we have to reestablish our confidence and our faith in him sometimes we just have to stop in our hectic lifestyles and reassess our relationship with God the word of God tells us in Mark chapter 8 verse 36 what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul. Hear this pastor on this Sunday morning. We can become the wealthiest businessmen and businesswomen in town. But if we lose our soul, we have accomplished nothing. If I become the most famous person and I lose my soul, what does it profit me? If my talents and abilities lead me to a music record deal and to a place of notoriety, what does it profit me? If I lose my own soul. I don't know about you, but on this Sunday morning, all of God's blessings in my life, they're wonderful, but they're not worth me losing my soul. I must keep in mind the blessing is not because of me. It's not because of what I've done, but it's because of the hand of God. Moses had just taken a costly stand for God. And let me stop right there. The blood of his countrymen, think about this. He had just been responsible for people losing their life. He said, if you're with God, you stand over here. And everybody that's standing over there, I want you to go and kill them. Can you imagine the weight that's standing now on Moses' shoulders? He's doing what God wants him to do, but it wasn't an easy thing. His spirit is broken. For the AC, I can imagine he's crushed because those people that he's walked with. Oh, yeah, he got aggravated at times. You can read it in the scriptures. He got aggravated with them at times. I mean, who wouldn't? You deliver them out of bondage and you're standing at the Red Sea and now they're saying, just take us back. Now, I didn't go through all that to take you back. It ain't happening. I can imagine now he's looking at some of these people and he's crushed. And and sometimes it's after we take a stand that we dip to our lowest of lows. Listen, taking a stand for God ain't all about the feel goods. Because sometimes you ain't going to feel good. I've had to make decisions in pastoring that I cried about for days. I'll be honest with you. I hated it. But I had to understand I'm standing on what's right. You will do the same thing in your life. When you stand for what's right, not everybody's going to agree with you. And you will be surprised by some people that will choose sides. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Sometimes the emotional cost of insisting on doing what is right can bring you to a lonely place. Such a lonely place that you don't feel God anymore. Sir... Ma'am, hear me today. Don't feel ashamed if you've walked into this building feeling lonely and hungry and empty. You simply need something fresh that God can provide. All of us in this room have been or will be at some point in our lives in that very place. Even the great apostle Paul would cry out at one point in his life after he's done miracles and after he's seen people filled with the Holy Ghost, Oh, that I might know him. Paul, come on, devils are scared of you, Paul. You walk into town, you cast them out. You want to know him? You do know him, Paul. He's at a place in his life where he's saying, God, I just need you to keep reaching to me. I just need you to keep touching me. We need to pray, Lord, show me your way. Lord, 
I don't want to just know you. I want you to truly know me. And so, I'm going to change this here. It's kind of crazy stuff. Here, here we are in the story. And, and what, I, what I take courage in is this. God answered a lonely man's prayer. God is never, hear me today, God is never offended by your prayer for renewal. It is never out of order to take a trip to the altar. God help us never to lose our sensitivity to our own spiritual needs. God, I don't want to be so busy reaching somebody else that I forget. I got to have a personal walk with you. Help us never to hesitate to take a trip back to the altar in spite of what somebody might say. I don't get worried about those that stay in the altar. I get worried about those that won't pray. When people feel like they can preach without praying, they got a problem. When people feel like they can read, reach the lost without praying, they got a problem. When we think we can live for God without talking to Him on a daily basis, folks, we got a problem. I don't worry about those that always come to the altar. I worry about those who won't talk to God. Because what happens, is, and I'm telling you folks, we are getting there where even the religious world is doing what's right in their own eyes. I'm not going to go any deeper than that. But I know of churches in our area that are considering things right now. And I'm telling you, in the word of God, it's not right. We have to stand upon the word. Now, let me flip that over and say something to you today. While we are standing on what is right, hear me today. We still must speak with love. We have to. They will respect you for what you say if you can say it in a right way. Boy, it's going to get quiet in here, but I'm going to stay there. I must show the glory of God. And sometimes when God's glory starts shining through me, what did he say? Let the glory of the gospel of Christ shine in your hearts. When the glory of the gospel starts shining in your life, it is going to point out what's wrong in our world. But it's up to us to let the love of God show as well. They're going to know that you're my disciples by how you love one another. Now don't take that one another out of context. I saw one popular preacher post this week, and I said, whoa, wait a minute. That one another is talking about the church, so don't take that verse out of context. But you have plenty of verses in Scripture where it talks about Jesus loving the sinner. So our love does not stop here, although that's how they know we're his disciples, by how we love each other. But they're going to know him through how we love them. And there's plenty of Scripture to back that up. I know it's difficult sometimes to make it through the veil of tears during the hard times. But you must do it because people are watching your life to see the difference that the Lord has made in you. We need to come weeping back to the starting point and touch God all over again. The psalmist said in Psalm 30 verse 5, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. God answered Moses' prayer. Moses said, God, you called me. You told me to bring this people out of Egypt and into Canaan, but you never told me who was going to be helping me or who would go with me. You said, I found grace in your eyes. You said you knew my name, but I don't understand. If it's true, then please, Lord, let me feel your presence. And the Lord answers in Exodus 33, verse 14. My presence shall go with thee. God understood the mental and emotional pressure that Moses was under. Because he added, look at the next step. And I will give. No, I'm sorry, go back to that verse. And I, in the end of it, will give the rest. Moses understood that this was the answer to the greatest need. The presence of God was everything that he had to have. 
I wonder sometimes, Harvest Church, if we have forgotten that what we really need above and beyond anything else is the presence of of God for sometimes we have so many of the trappings of church we have so many various styles of worship that we forget that no matter how many choirs or how much music or how much our beautiful buildings become if God is not here it's not worth doing anything and while I thank God for the extras that we have if we don't have any of those things but we have God we have everything that we need for apostolic revival Come on, somebody. We need the presence of God like we've always needed it. I don't care if it's 2019. Before I need a sound system, I need the presence of God. Before I need video cameras, I need the presence of God. I'm telling you, this world today is sick of laughing blessings and filthy hands. They're tired of a lack of anointing. They are hungry for God's presence. We're in a church today that we want the glory of God. Because if we have, let me, let me go, if we want revival, and if we want to see this place filled, we have to follow what John 12 said. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up in the, or from the earth, will draw all men unto me. We are continuing to preach the truth. We're continuing to reach the lost and a dying world. And what you feel that is different in this house today is the glory of God. And he wants you to reach out to him like he's reaching out to you today. Can I say this? You don't have to leave the same way you came. You can become a new creature in him. Moses understood this need of God to the point where he said, that's fine, but if you don't go, we don't want to go. And if you're not going, don't take us there. Just let us stay right here. And that was in the wilderness. Moses was not satisfied. Here was God saying, I'm going with you, Moses. Don't worry about it. I'll be there. My presence will be with you. But Moses still said, I need more. God he said, this is the only way for people to know you're with us. The only way we will be separated from the world is if you are there and you stay with us. In essence, what Moses is saying, God, I've heard you say this before, but now I need to know. I, I, I believe you, but I need to know. He had the word of God, and he still says, I need more. Sometimes we hear it with our ears, and we perceive it with our minds. But hear me today, do we really know? And sometimes we'll go to meetings and we clap and we shout and we feel good about ourselves and we should. But we walk out the door with some same doubts and some fears and the same old questions that we walked in with. Folks, it is a danger when church just becomes an exercise in religion but doesn't get deep down where our fears are. And the doubts in our minds and the questions that haunt us at night when the church ain't around. And Moses seemed to be saying here, I've been on the mountain, Jesus, or God, I, I've walked through the sea, Lord. I've stood in the court of Pharaoh and I've heard your word. I've heard your voice and somehow I've walked this far. But I cannot go any further just going through the motions and getting blessed in the moment. I cannot make it from mountaintop to mountaintop anymore. I have to let this thing get beyond my head and get in my heart. I've got to say Settle some things once and for all. God. Listen, God has called you and God has equipped you and he has put his name upon you. I'm speaking to somebody in this room today. He's given you blessing and he's given you power and authority. He has given you his spirit in your life, but you need it to go deeper than just in your head. You needed to get down into the doubt and the fears of the common problems you're facing today and let God work it out. You see, God was still not offended. This, this is what blows me away. Even when Moses said, you said it, but I need more. I got your word, but I need more. God wasn't offended. God answers again. Moses, I'm telling you, I'm going with you. I told you I know. I said that I, I put my blessings on you. I said you found grace in my sight. I said I've called you. I know your name. It's interesting to note, Moses is still not satisfied. God had patiently answered his plea for assurance twice. Yet Moses is still hungry. I beg you, Moses said. I've heard of it. 
I've, I've caught glimpses of it, God. I've seen the results of it. But now I beg you, I need to see your glory. Let's bring this down to where we are in Humboldt, Tennessee. This preacher you're looking at today, I am the blessing and the beneficiary of generation of commitment. My grandfather was a preacher. My dad pastored this church. I pastor a church that we've had great men of God serve since its conception in, in, in 1957. I'm the beneficiary today of an organization that was started by men who God, uh, that, that, that men of God who saw from their vantage point dangers down the road that would confront us. They saw things that I wonder sometimes if we still recognize today. I've seen the results of prayer. I've seen the results of commitment. I've seen the results of total dedication. But sooner or later, we have to quit looking in the rearview mirror. And we have to say, God, I need it today. And folks, it's not just going to happen. It comes through prayer. And I know it gets uncomfortable. I'm not gauging our prayer life today by how many comes to Tuesday night prayer because I know work schedules and things hurt that. But I am praying, God, grip us for a daily prayer life. Because here's the deal. It's not enough to hear about the glory of God. We must see it for ourselves. God, I've seen your power. I've seen the miracles. I've seen the effects. God, I want to see your glory. That is the hunger of today. I'm telling you, I'm preaching youth services a lot, and I'm seeing it all across our movement. Young people are crying out, God, show us your glory. In a matter of a couple of months, there's going to be over 40,000 young people gathering in an arena. That is unheard of. And it's growing nonstop to the point where now they're even talking about what are we going to do with it because it's getting so big it's limiting us and where we're going. Never would have thought we'd have been to that day. But we're getting to Moses' day where even at the building of the tabernacle they said, quit bringing stuff. I don't need it. I can't use it. We're getting to the point now our crowds are getting so big we're having to think about what do we do next. That's a good problem. Because young people are hungry, saying, God, show us your glory. God responds to Moses, I will. I'll let my goodness pass by. I don't know what Moses had in mind when he asked to see the glory of God. Did he want to see God's face? Did he want to see the image of God? I'm not sure. But God said, if you want to see my glory, what I can show you is my goodness. And his mercy and his love are the expression of the glory of God. God is not in the building business. God's not into religion. God's into people. And he is hungry to show his glory by his goodness to people. The eyes of the Lord runneth to and fro throughout the whole earth that he might show himself strong, not on behalf of an organization, not on behalf of man-made abilities, not on behalf of just, just uh, programs, but he says on behalf of people. God said, I'll show you my goodness and I'll proclaim my name. And God told Moses, you can't see my face. No one can see my face and live. I'm too much for you. You can't handle what I'm capable of. You can't see my face. You, can't, you cannot hope to comprehend all that I can do. Listen, we just cannot see it all. He is, he's far beyond our abilities to assimilate. But he says, there is a place, and I can take you there. There is a place where you can see my goodness and hear my name proclaimed. I've come to tell a hurting soul or a discouraged saint of God on this Sunday morning that there is a place where you can still see his goodness, even though there's not a lot of good things that's happening at that point and we can hear God's voice even though there's a lot of things that are screaming at us where is that place God said Moses that place is right beside me it is in my presence you're not going to find it in the world or in church growth concepts it's not found in seminars and books and podcasts you'll find it when you step into the presence of God today I'm speaking of a place to where he can take you and your questions and your fears can subside. There is a place where needs are truly met and where the goodness and the name of God are evident and it's in His presence. This is why I said it earlier. Lord, don't ever let us look at a service and say it's a wasted service. 
to us, it should never just be a Wednesday or a Sunday when we're in His presence. The Bible says there is fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore. His name is there. His goodness is there. His glory is there. Where is this place? It's in Iraq. I'm almost done today. It's in <coughs> a solid, strong, unchanging, unmoved rock, a place that does not change with the sands of time. Its doctrines are not going to change. Its stands are not going to be altered. We are on the rock. And in the cleft of the rock, we will see God. Hear me today. You don't have to leave the church. You are not going to find what you're looking for out there. It is in an unmovable word, the word of God, where God has placed his name and in his presence, you will find his glory. I'm talking to every young adult in this room today, they will talk to you and they'll try to make stuff sound like truth that is not truth. And they'll convince you that to be a part of a growing church, you have to compromise. Stop listening. I'm standing in the authority of a pastor today and in the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We must understand the presence of God is where revival is coming from. Well, if you would stop preaching so hard and screaming so loud, people would come. I don't believe you. I can point to you, Pearland, Texas, a little town that is not very big at all, runs over 600 people on Sunday. And if you want to hear some red-hot preaching, you just tune in. Wayne Huntley went into North Carolina. You ain't ever heard preaching. You need to go hear Wayne Huntley. Boy, can preach the house down. Built a church out of nothing. Him and his wife went in there with nobody and built a church. Why? Not because he could scream and shout. That's not what I'm saying. But with the presence of God and the anointing of God, whatever happens is going to draw the sinner. It's not going to push them away. Have a house full of guests. Let's don't water down our worship. What they've come for is to experience the glory of God. Not to experience the shout of so-and-so. That's not what we're saying. But when God starts moving, their focus ain't going to be on the shout. Their focus is going to be on, oh, I'm feeling something different right now. There's a change that can happen in my life right now. I'm feeling a drawing to the Spirit of God. The answer is not to water down our message and our worship. The answer is to get the presence of God. Having said that, there are times, I'm preaching right now and I'm not screaming at you, okay? There are times where God wants to move through teaching as well. Wednesday nights right now are accomplishing a purpose. Well, that went over good, but it did. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm getting more response out of us slowing down and just talking some things out right now than what we would in just preaching it. Why? Because God uses different modes and methods. The Bible says he gave some pastors, teachers. You can go through those ministries that the Lord uses. Let's don't box him in. 2019 is out of the box year. Let's don't box him in. The preacher don't have to scream for me to say amen. The worship team don't have to sing a song that's a 90 to nothing song for me to worship. And when they do, I'm going to still worship. And you know what? I, I've been in, listen, camp, I better be careful because this is live stream. Camp a few years ago, I told my wife, I didn't know any of the songs. I'm telling you, I didn't have a clue. Here I am, they've put me on the front row, Tennessee District Secretary, Youth Secretary. I had no clue what those songs were. Did I sit down and fold my hands and say, well, shoot, I don't know anything. I can't worship. No. I sure had to rely on what I felt in my heart and just told the Lord how I felt because I couldn't sing it. I didn't know it. But I still was able to worship. I've had the same thing happen. We was preaching one place, and uh, Mom and Dad was with us that night. And uh, it was a youth rally, and apparently there was a guest there that day, and uh, they asked him to sing Spur of the Moment. Lord, they sang a song. I thought it was a new song, Brother White. I had no clue. I had never heard it. Mom and dad came up to me and said, did you know that song? 
It's one of those dead giveaways. I was on the platform. No, I didn't know that song. They could see it all over my face. You know, I'm just clapping, you know. I have no clue. <laughs> it was an older song. Here's the deal. Whether it's a new or old song is not the issue. The issue is who are we worshiping and praising? The issue is I need the presence of God. And whatever attracts his presence is what we want to do. Now, I do believe in a blend. I'm going to leave that alone. Show me your glory. And we do that. We, we give a blend. But the important thing is, God, I must have your presence. Let me close with this. Brother Cannon, come back to music. How do I get there, preacher? God instructed Moses how to do it. He said, here's what you do. Tonight, you go out and you cut some slates of stone. God provided the first tables. Moses broke those in his anger and hurt. This time, God said, I'm not going to give it to you. You don't take care of what I gave you, so now you go work for it. Boy, that's a whole other sermon for another time. Move on, Seth. I think God was simply saying, Moses, let's start fresh. You messed up, that's okay. Let's start over. Let me stop right there and tell somebody today. And I felt this in prayer this morning, and I added this to my notes last minute. Somebody has walked into this place and you're wondering what do you do next because of a mistake. If you want to experience the glory of God, your mistake does not erase where you started. Go back to the beginning. Walk in his footsteps that you've already made. You bring the tables and God will write it again. God may have gave it to you the first time. But this time he says, you go back and you bring me what you've got now. And I will start it over again. Brother Brown, one of the most aggravating games in the world is Monopoly. You can be sitting there loaded. All the money, all the property. Man, you're about ready to win that game. All it takes is for the right card. And it's wiped out. And as frustrating as I get with that game, never have I said, well, I quit. Because there's always a chance if they can get that card, I can too. And I'm going to fight to the end. Hear me today. It may feel like your life is just wiped out. My Bible says, he that shall endure Unto the end, the same shall be saved. Because hear me today. My house, my vehicles, my bank account is not going to matter when the trumpet sounds. I can't take it with me. But what does matter is my soul. Exodus 34, the Lord passed by before him in verse 6. And he proclaimed. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sins. Moses made haste. He, he bowed his head toward the earth. He worshiped God. I could read and read and read here, but I won't for the sake of time. The voice of the Lord gave a very, it was a self-description of his own mercy and goodness and truth. And Moses' heart was lifted and he worshiped again like he had once worshiped, feeling again like he had once felt. Moses asked God three times, show me your glory. God gave him what he asked for. But you know what? It's just something with God. God always goes a little further than what you've asked. Moses had not asked for it, but God said this in Exodus 34 and 10, my last verse. Behold, I make a covenant before all the people. I'm going to do marvels. Such has not been seen or done in the earth, nor any nation, and all the people among which thou shalt see the work of the Lord. For it's a terrible thing that I will do with you. Now that word terrible does not mean what you're thinking of is terrible. Sometimes in the King James it can flip that around. In other words, what a great thing is going to happen to you. The effects are going to be of such a magnitude, people are going to stand back and say, that had to be the hand of God. For us to hunger until we see His glory is the doorway 
to revival in our lives and in our churches. Stand with me today. What we have only imagined is possible. God wants to show us his glory in this generation. And I say this generation, I'm not just saying because of the age. I'm saying you're living in this generation. Whether you're 80 years old, 100 years old, or 20, you're living in this generation. And God wants to show it to us. How many would agree with me today? God wants to reveal himself to hungry people. So I'm preaching today, trying to encourage you. We cannot go on in our discouragement and just pretend that everything's all right. That kills us. Acting like everything's just perfect and it's not. That's not Christianity. But if we'll pick up the shattered remnants of the tables of stone. And you know what? If you try to put them back together and convince yourself that you've succeeded, well, that's good enough. I can still read most of it. You still lose. But if we allow what happens in the camp, hear me today, if we allow what happens in the camp to keep us off the mountain, Moses could have said, I'm never going back to that mountain again. What good does it do, Sister Shayla? Because as soon as I came down, they broke every last commandment, didn't even know about it. But he didn't let what happened in the valley keep him from going back to the mountain. Don't let the discouraging times stop you from the renewal that God wants to give you. My situations are not so bad that it has really rocked heaven to the point they don't even know what to do. What I need to do is I need to get into the presence of God. We can do better. We can go back to the mountain. Yes, you may have made a mistake. No matter how much we feel that our lives are shattered to pieces today, if you will be willing to make that trek back to the place where it all began, an altar of repentance, God meets us there. And you know what? Ezekiel said, a new heart also will I give you. A new spirit also will I put within you. There's another passage that talks about writing it upon our hearts. He will engrave his word once again upon your heart and you'll be given another chance I serve a God today that says it doesn't matter how many times you've messed up if you'll come back to me I'll make you new again how many times did David fail brother Justin I find a whole lot of repentance prayers in the book of Psalms and not all those are wrote by, wrote by David let's talk a little totally out of context, but there are quite a few. And yet he was still called a man after God's own heart. Why? Now that man after God's own heart, how do you interpret that? He was still striving. Preached a message one time, it's time to get after it. It is. But the it must not be the things and the materialistic stuff. I need to have the presence of God. Would you pray with me right now? Lord, we need your help today. I feel such a burden in this building today, God. You know who's here. You know what's going on in our lives. I've been out of town. There's no way for me to know everything that's happening in this room today. The discouragement, the hurt, the broken lives that walk into this building today. God, we're so good at putting on our apostolic facades. And God, we're so good at trying to fill the the void in our lives. Even us Christians and us born-again believers. We're so good at trying to plug in what should be a spiritual thing. And we plug in materials. And while it may provide temporary satisfaction, eventually there's still a void. God, help us in this room today to have a fresh desire. As the heart panteth after the water broke. So my soul, oh God, longs for you. I don't want to just pastor this church, God. I want us to be a people that's hungry for you. I don't want to go through my life wandering here and there. God, I need your glory. And just like the children of Israel from this moment forward, there was a visible presence of God. 
There was a fire at night. There was a cloud in the day. And their steps were covered as they went. God, us here at Harvest Church, we don't go want to go anywhere without you. Every place that we go, God, we want your covering. We need your anointing to be upon us, oh God. Every card that is handed out, let your glory be shown. Every post, whether it's on social media or a conversation that we have, we want your glory to shine. We want people to understand, God, that yes, we stand for truth. But Lord, we need you to work in lives because we can't, we can't debate anybody into truth. We, O oh Lord, cannot argue with anybody into salvation. But Lord, there must be a change of heart. We need revival, O oh God. Stir our souls today, O oh Lord. If there's going to be a change in our world, it must begin with us. Would you lift your voice with me right now and begin to talk to the Lord? I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. I don't want to move too fast from this moment today, but I feel the presence of God working in our midst right now. Come on, somebody, lift your voice in this place today and begin to talk to God on your own. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, that it is true and still uh, working in our midst today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Would you love the Lord together in this place today and tell Him what He means to you in this house? God, I thank you, O oh Lord Jesus, that you saved me. And God, I know, Lord, that I may not be exactly where I want to be today, but you can, Lord, draw us closer to you through this time together. Hallelujah, hallelujah. They're beginning to sing today. I'm opening these altars. Would you find a place to pray today? This is not going to be a time where we're praying for one another. Would you find a place for soul searching today in your own heart? Come on, people are coming today. Would you come? Would you join us in a time of, of prayer today? Whether it's a time of repentance, if you've made mistakes, God's able to help you. If you need the blood to be applied again over the doorpost of your house or your life, let it be done today.